All right, how's that sound? Can you hear us okay? Great. Uh, well, hi everybody and welcome to our uh, one, two, three, four, fifth uh, event of our 2023 ninth annual Animal Law Week here at Harvard Law School. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking our partners, the Harvard Animal Law Society, a uh, student group who has been one of the most active we've ever had. I think it's the largest student board we've ever had with 11 members. Um, and it just really reflects a, just such wonderful student interest we have here at, at Harvard Law School and Animal Law. I mean, students are the lifeblood of any institution. And I think this year we had 82 students on the wait list for our wildlife law class, 31 students on the wait list for our farm animal course, and we quintupled the applications to our animal law clinic this year. So uh, really impressive. So thank you so much to the students for everything they do to, to make this work. Um, well, we have a, a, a wonderful uh, panel for you today. Um, looking at the issue of achieving a regulatory approval for cultivated meat products. Um, and we have two experts in the field, not just, you know, people who sometimes may, might know something about something, but these are the people who are actually on the front line, taking meetings with the White House, taking meetings with USDA and FDA, and really forging, uh, forging a pathway and, and trail on all this. Come on, you're welcome to come on in. Um, uh, so I'm going to, so Dipti Kulkarni, she is at, at Covington. Um, she's an attorney who represents uh, several of the cultivated meat companies and has been really active in the alternative proteins regulatory space. Uh, Eric Filsa is with Upside Foods. They are the leading company, uh, certainly also the most uh, well-funded company uh, in the cultivated meat space. But again, they are, are blazing the trail and they were the first company to achieve uh, FDA preclearance on a cultivated meat product. And it was just back in November, right? Um, so I'm gonna give you just a quick uh, intro overview as to how we got here. And then we'll hand it over and we'll bounce back and forth a little bit. And then I can throw some questions. So, um, you know, it's sort of like the hand is quicker than the eye. Science is often quicker than the law. Uh, in 2013, uh, a guy named Mark Post, a scientist uh, out of the Netherlands, uh, created the first cultivated hamburger. Um, I think the price for that was uh, like 350,000 euros. Um, it was like nearly a million dollars per pound. Um, and, but that was proof of concept. It showed that it actually be done. So a couple of years later in 2015, uh, Bruce Friedrich, uh, an attorney, he founded a, what was called the Good Food Institute, uh, which now I think has something like 80 employees. And they essentially were sort of like a, an industry trade group for an industry that didn't yet exist. Uh, and their idea was to really draw attention to alternative proteins, especially cultivated uh, meat and poultry products, and to um, help with getting public both financing and funding and also public awareness and acceptance. Um, the following year in 2016, uh, a group called New Harvest held the first ever uh, cellular agriculture conference in San Francisco. Um, and I attended that. And in just talking to people, I was a little surprised that nobody was discussing the regulatory aspect of this. Uh, and when I would ask people about it, I would either be met with a blank stare or a dirty look. Uh, the, the dirty look folks were like, hey, shut the hell up. We're trying to fundraise here. We don't want anyone to know that there's potential hurdles. Um, the others were just like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a business person. You know, I'm, I'm a scientist. I'm sure there's smart people like Dippy that will figure this out down the road. Uh, and so then I would kind of bring up like, well, you, you're, you're aware of what happened with, with, with GMO salmon, right? I'm like, what do you mean? And like, well... It only from the from the first FDA filing for uh, to get a regulatory approval for genetically modified salmon, uh, it literally was 26 years uh, before they were actually able to go to market. So can you imagine one of your investors like I created the perfect cultivated chicken nugget? Like great, we should be able to you know sell our first product you know in 20 whatever 53 or something. So uh, fun fact, both Dipti and I worked on that. My apologies, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you achieved success actually at the end. But yeah, I mean it was it was challenging. Pure victory. We'll take it. <laughs> um, and so then, there, so there's not only that problem, but there's also the other issue of, you know, really we wanted to make sure that uh, that people were approaching this in the right way. So I came back, uh, and you know, we were what we would call like the Leroy Jenkins problem of like someone rushing through the door unprepared and getting everyone else behind them slaughtered uh, for an unslaughtered product. Uh, so then we decided in 2018 to host this, or at the time we called the Clean Meat Regulatory Roundtable where we brought in a bunch of experts. Uh, we had former FDA attorneys. We had uh, Ann Veneman, former Secretary of U.S. Secretary of Agriculture. We had the heads of several companies. We had scientists like uh, Mark Post and Ben Sewell. Uh, we had folks from the Good Food Institute. We really wanted a, a array of perspectives to see if we could actually, and it was a closed door confidential session, 
to see if we could really identify, uh, achieve some consensus and identify a regulatory path forward and then what we might do with that. So um, we actually did achieve quite a bit of consensus in that, in that meeting. And then we submitted some uh, comments to the FDA and USC on how they might divvy up the jurisdiction between the two agencies. Um, and then, then both uh, uh, Eric and, and Dipti went to work uh, and they uh, sort of achieved exactly that goal. So with that, I will hand it over to them to talk more, more about that process. Thanks so much, Chris. And, and um, Eric and I participated in that round table. Eric, I couldn't attend the person, but I was here. And I just want to emphasize how much of a critical role it played in shaping the industry. And that happened, I don't think, in this building, Chris, but in here. Yeah, it was over in Lewis. <laughs> Not very bad. Just turn your microphone up a little bit. Ah, thank you. Ooh. So what we're going to talk about today, we're going to, you know, sort of give you an overview of the relevance that the provisions lay a foundation for how all of this is going to, all of this is regulated. So they took three existing statutes that have been in place for many years. Then we'll walk through the regulatory history, some of which Chris already, already talked about. Um, I'd love for this to be interactive. So please, if you have questions, raise your hand. Don't feel like you have to wait for it. And I'll just add that uh, Diffie and I both worked at FDA together. Diffie was my boss's boss. I am not a lawyer. So um, I am a genetic engineer and I have a PhD in, in, in biomedical sciences. So my understanding of this is largely because of Diffie and the work we did at FDA together. Um, so when, I, when she says it is collaborative, please jump in. That is how we even work together. So please do. <laughs> So we often like to begin with a slide like this one to sort of emphasize, you know, the, the extraordinary time that we're in right now with respect to our food system and our food culture. Innovators are finding new and different ways to make food, um, often with the goal of making more food, food to feed a grown planet without having to rely on animal agriculture or other ways to make the production process far more sustainable. Companies exactly like these foods. Um, consumer interests and expectations are rapidly evolving. Many consumers are asking questions about how their food is made and looking for healthier or more sustainable alternatives. At the same time, um, the world's population is growing exponentially and is expected to reach uh, 9 billion people in the next 30 years, which means we're going to have to produce more food to feed more people, but with a with a not expanding physical environment, right? Um, and against this backdrop, regulators are recalibrating, rethinking regulatory frameworks to kind of keep pace with this innovation, which as Chris said at the outset is always going to outpace law policy and regulation. Um, and in fact, FDA in particular, uh, you know, has emphasized that in the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to see more innovation in food than this country has seen in the last 50 years. And, you know, we don't have a highly functioning Congress um, and, you know, amending laws takes time. So how do we apply pre-existing regulatory frameworks in the right way to assure that we're facilitating innovation while protecting the, the food supply and making sure that labeling is, is uh, appropriate, truthful, and not misleading. So on our agenda for today, we will talk about the regulatory framework. We're gonna recap who the relevant federal regulatory agencies are and why. And then we'll talk about cultivated meat and seafood specifically. Eric is gonna tell us how they make the meat. Um, and then we'll walk through the regulatory history and talk about what to expect next. And I will say again, both Dipti and I, from our regulatory background, both live at the front lines of this now from a federal regulatory perspective and as on this industry side. <clears throat> so just keep in mind throughout this talk the idea that change of the old maxim, the change is, is gradual and then sudden and all at once. And I think that's very important to think about as we approach the regulatory frameworks of any new industry. And you have to be prepared for that suddenness that inevitably occurs. Okay, 
So be beginning with basic principles, get a highly evolving uh, food system, and we have a, a, a pretty stagnant uh, regulatory framework. So what are the questions you can answer? Who are the relevant regulatory agencies and companies? What will they regulate and how, and what comes next? And sort of a threshold question, and I'm interested when people's thoughts is, why does a regulatory framework even matter in a climate like this? Does anybody want to try to answer that question? Why do we need a regulatory framework that is predictable, clearly defined? Right. I mean, well, one one obvious reason is there'd be chaos otherwise, and there's, you know, there's no rules and there's no regulations. It's a free for all, and people can do what they like, and you know, it's it's not healthy for humans, and it's not healthy for animals, and so forth. Exactly. Right. A regulatory framework tells society whether and how to trust the product that's made that comes out of it and why, right? In order for that regulatory framework to be appropriately tailored to technology, it should be based on science, it should be based on risk, and the agency should have the authorities to do uh, the activities that would be required in order to, uh, under that framework. Um, and second, and I think Eric can chime in here as well, if there isn't a clearly defined regulatory framework that's predictable, why and how will companies be able to create this technology that will solve some of the most pressing challenges that we face as, a, as you know, humankind if, they, if there's no regulatory certainty that they're going to be able to come onto market and how, and Chris touched on this, Will investors know that they'll reap a return on their investment? That's correct. There's a necessary tension between regulated industry and regulators. Um, and that is also balancing this the cost of innovation on the innovation side and balance of the requirement of safety. So a predictable regulatory framework provides in you know, many ways you can think of regulators in that system then as brokers of reality. Um, and if we can align on that, then there's a pathway through for us. And I think that's why you see headlines like the ones you're seeing on the screen here, right? That we have these foods that are challenging our pre-existing notions of what food is supposed to be, what it's supposed to be called, how it fits within certain paradigms. Um, but the questions that you see on the screen can generally be answered when faced with new technology. So let's, let's try to answer them here. So beginning with who are the relevant regulatory agencies and why, um, the primary regulatory agencies with oversight over food are the FDA, USDA, EPA. The Federal Trade Commission also plays a role with respect to advertising. So starting on the far left, FDA regulates food and interstate commerce under its very expansive Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act. It also has other statutory authorities in which it can regulate um, the spread of potential communicable disease and foods. Um, USDA has, has a, a laundry list of statutes. Here, the most relevant are the inspection acts, which give the agency authority to um, oversee the inspection and processing of various foods. EPA regulates, among other things, um, insecticides, fungicides, and, and toxic substances, including those that make their way into food in coordination with FDA. And the FTC um, has oversight over marketing, particularly advertising in the space. So let's break some of this down. Um, FDA regulatory oversight. So under the Federal Food Drug and Cosmetic Act, FDA regulates the safety and labeling of food. I'll talk about what food means in the next slide. Um, and that typically means plant-based foods, dairy, seafood, with the exception of catfish. Um, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Just, Thanks to you all, by the way. It's a long story that we will uh, say for another day. Um, and under those authorities, that they determine the safety of new ingredients, including those in plant-based foods, seafood. And something that is often not known is also in meat and poultry products. Um, FDA regulates things like microbial, algal, and fungal cells that are generated by large-scale culture. So think about precision fermentation. Think about precursors to precision fermentation, like enzymes that are used in processing. 
FDA re regulates food products of biotechnology, which Eric worked on um, for the agency, including biotech crops and biotech animals. And the FDA also regulates the safety and labeling of what are called non-specified meats, um, which you know are sort of exotic meats that don't fall within the context of what your typical livestock um, and poultry products are considered. So unpacking statutory authority, the Federal Food and Cosmetic Act has a definition for food that was added to the statute in 1938. Food has an incredibly circular definition. Food is articles used for food or drink from other animals. So thank you, Congress. That really clears it up for us. Um, chewing gum, if anybody that was, Yeah, that was it. That was it. We all packed it up and went home. Well, it's never a question ever again. I'm just going to go with you. Just set my laptop on some here in the classroom. Great. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, <laughs> articles used for components in food. Um, uh, shortly before the Federal Food and Cosmetic Act was passed, the Inspection Act, well, the Federal Meat uh, Inspection Act was passed. Um, this was shortly after Optimus and Players, the, the Jungle was published, and uh, the American public and uh, the administration. Um, made calls for uh, there to be, you know, oversight over meat uh, processing and slaughterhouses. So the way that Congress did get that oversight was that meat and meat food products, and then the poultry products passed in the seventies. Poultry products are exempt from FDA statute, with the exception of ingredients. And so that's how USDA and FDA did the up that pie, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. USDA has oversight over meat and poultry products as defined in their statute, among other foods. And the remaining food is subject to FDA oversight, with the exception of catfish. Um, under FDA's authority, FDA does not pre approve foods. It's not like a medical product that's subject to a, a, a pre approval. Um, there's an exception to that to, for new ingredients that are called food additives. Um, and uh, a product that contains a food additive, if something truly is a food additive, that is unapproved, is automatically deemed unsafe and cannot be moved into interstate commerce. So what does that mean in terms of regulatory jurisdiction between FDA and USDA? The way that Congress defined a food additive is pretty broad. It's from an amendment to the statute in 1958. Um, and what, Congress, what that language says is that a food additive is any substance the intended use of which may reasonably be expected to result directly or indirectly in its becoming a food. There are a number of exceptions to that definition which you appear to see here on the, slot, on the slide, including foods that are generally recognized as safe, grass substances. We're not going to spend much time talking about that today because it's not directly relevant to, to cultivating meat. But that's the general frame um, for, for new ingredients. If something is a food additive, the new ingredient that's added to food that is doesn't otherwise fall within an exemption, is not generally recognized to say it's subject to pre-market oversight by, by FDA. And FDA relies upon this authority in regulating foods, including novel foods more generally. Interestingly, Congress kept that authority, the authority to consider the safety of new ingredients with FDA, even for meat and poultry. And so if, if Eric were in another line of business, he was making some kind of binder to be added to a conventional software, <laughs> his product would still be subject to FDA oversight. It wouldn't solely be subject to USDA oversight. So moving to the next slide. Um, Product naming. Uh, this this gets a lot of attention. Um, makes makes um, its way into headlines quite a bit. The way that FDA regulates product naming is that the front of your food label that's subject to FDA oversight has to bear a name that's called a statement of identity. And under the federal framework, and this applies on the USDA side as well, there's a hierarchical way in which food is labeled. If if that food is subject to something called a standard of identity, it must uh, use that specific term and it must meet 
the specific requirements of that standard of identity. You can think of it as like a recipe or a monograph. Um, and standards of identity were passed um, in the 50s, moving up to the 70s. And you transport yourself back to that time. The thinking was that, you know, in order for consumer, in order to prevent deception in, in grocery stores and other places, you needed standardized foods for our most important products, right? Our most important products are things like, at the time, our packaged foods and things like milk and eggs and interestingly cherry pie and French dressing are subject to standards of identity. If you're not subject to a standard of identity, then you have to bear a common or neutral name. Um, and and unless, unless there is no such common or neutral name. And a common or neutral name is one that's established through common usage or by regulation. And if you don't fall within a standard of identity, a common or usual name, then what's left is that you have to use an appropriately descriptive term for the top of your products. And what's happened um, in the last 20 years is, or more really, um, is that new foods are coming onto the marketplace that don't fit within the standards of identity that are promulgated in those golden years. Um, are new, so can you say that they have a common or usual name? Has it been a static common usage? And so there's been a lot of debate over is the terminology that's used for these new foods um, infringing upon a standard of identity or is it uh, an appropriately descriptive term? And I'll give you an example if you can read it here. Um, the, there's a standard of identity for milk, cow's milk. Uh, and part of it says that milk is the lacteal secretion obtained by the complete milking of one or more healthy cows. And so if you're on one side of the debate, you might argue, oh, well, you can't use the term milk in product labeling unless you come from a cow. If you're on the other side of the debate, you might say, well, if you put the word almond or soy in front of it, then you're not infringing upon that standard of identity. You're not holding yourself out as representing that, that uh, or you're not holding yourself out as purporting to be that product. If I can just interject too, there might be some who even uh, might claim that given the uh, vast majority of cows that suffer from mastitis and others that uh, from laminitis, that you could make an argument that you know, a lot of the milk being sold that comes from cows are not because that I'm actually coming from healthy cows. And so about, if we were having this talk a couple months ago, this would still sort of be a debate. But at the beginning of the month, FDA issued a draft guidance that has been long awaited relating to plant-based dairy um, products in which FDA, among other things, concluded that the use of the term soy milk, almond milk, and other similar terms are common or usual names for plant-based products. And therefore those milk products fit within what you see in the second row here an established term by a, 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 a common or usual name established by common usage. That's a draft guidance. Um, it's not final yet. It's also a guidance. It's not, doesn't necessarily have binding effect. Um, so I think we'll continue to see some debate in this in the space. If I could just jump in again, um, as a plug for students to, to take our animal on policy clinic, uh, our clinic director, Kat Meyer, just said to jump out because we uh, there's some breaking news to talk about at the end. Um, but um, right when our clinic started, two of our students, uh, Kelly McGill and Gabriel Wilson, um, prepared some comments and went down to the FDA hearing on the whether on the milk labeling issue um, and their presentations. Uh, and then these dairy industry folks would get up and kind of say some things that weren't exactly accurate. And they said, you know, are, we, are we allowed to, to rebut that? I'm like, absolutely. And so they became sort of recourse that kept just jumping up and rebutting all of these uh, dairy industry people who were saying things that weren't accurate or true. Um, and then other people refer back and like, oh, that smart kid from Harvard said. And you can see like the, the FDA and the folks who were at the FDA nodding along as, as, as Kelly and Gabriel were, uh, were giving us some information. And um, and it's great. And they think they, they felt like they were they weren't actually like reading about animal law or talking about animal law. They're actually like actively engaged in doing animal law as, as students. And was, as you can see, it was success, successful. Um, so, so that that's a very high level overview of FDA. The pre-market oversight, the FDA oversight, the pre-market oversight largely fits from a food perspective on that food additive 
uh, authority labeling is subject, food labeling is subject to the hierarchical system that I just described on the last slide. Let's talk a little bit about USDA. Um, so under the um, Federal Meat Inspection Act and Policy Product Inspection Act, FMIA and PPIA, USDA's Food Safety Inspection Service has oversight over meat and meat food products and poultry and poultry products. Those terms are defined in statute and then by regulation. You fit within that category and you want to put your products in interstate commerce. USDA regulates slaughter and or processing of those products. USDA, unlike FDA, has pre-market approval over labels. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. You have, remember, FDA determines the safety of new ingredients. USDA determines the suitability. It's whether it's suitable for that particular use in the, in the meat or poultry product, and whether it's efficacious for that use. So let's talk a little bit about what, what meat and poultry means. What are their definitions? I'm not gonna read all the words on this, but these are definitions that, that folks like Eric and myself and Chris have been uh, you know, wrestling with over these last few years and, and trying to think about new technologies that might challenge some of these, these de definitions that were put in place you know, at, the, at the beginning of the 20th century. So meat in, under federal law is the part of the muscle of any cattle, sheep, swine, or goats that is skeletal or that is found in these specific areas um, of the body of the animal. A meat food product is any product capable of use as human food that's made wholly or in part from one part of that, that animal. Poultry is a little bit different because it's a smaller, it's a smaller beast. Um, uh, any domesticated bird, whether live or dead, and a poultry product is one that is um, any poultry carcass or part thereof. So as you're staring at these definitions, what what strikes you about them that makes it sort of challenging to say that a product like um, cultivated food, that uh, cultivated meat that Upside and others in the space are making fit within this definition, these definitions, or on the flip side, what makes you think, well, no, they clearly fit within this, these definitions, and here's how they could be defined, or here's how they could be, here's how they could uh, meet the criteria that's set forth in the definitions. For the poultry definition, I think the kind of carcass terminology might be problematic because you can't point to a specific like animal carcass from which you derive the product. You're probably going to get pushed back. We, we heard a lot of sort of concern about about the carcass term. We've seen some advocacy on the other side making the, the argument that you're making. Um, who wants to try to argue for the other side or argue against that very good observation? I think that's totally right. Probably the strongest thing would be to point to or part thereof or in part from. Mm -hmm. But obviously, I, I think you have a stronger part thereof seems to suggest that there is a part of it. Mm -hmm. Whereas in part from doesn't seem to have the same connotation. You got it. Okay. Okay. I was going to say also the in portion of too, which is also not mandating that it's an entire band. Exactly. Those are excellent observations. So, so the meat definition, there are parts of the body of the animal that as a society, particularly uh, under law, uh, there's been a conclusion that those are parts of the animal that humans consume. There are meat food products as opposed to other parts of the animal that might be treated as in some other category. The, in the poultry definition, of course, it has the word carcass, but it also has part thereof. Um, there's also other language about uh, wholly or in part or part thereof. And so those are the words that, that uh, companies in this space have been focusing on to assert um, uh, that they fit within the category of products that get to bear these sorts of terms um, that conventional products get to, to bear. Um, so thinking about inspection and compliance, and I know Chris, Chris and I talked about this early on, USDA has oversight over mandatory inspection of slaughtering and processing. And I think a lot of us, when we think about 
how meat is made, think about the slaughtering part of it. Um, but a lot of products in the US are, uh, or a lot of facilities in the US are actually processing facilities. Two thirds of the facilities that are regulated by FSIS are processing their meat into finished products. And when the USDA conducts those inspections, it's, it's not necessarily looking at anti-mortem or post-mortem kind of safety analyses that, are, that fall within its paradigm. It's looking at um, the food safety manufacturing process with respect to processing and verifying labeling. Why do you think that's important? Why am I, why am I spending so much time talking about processing over slaughtering um, animals? I'm going to ask, oh, yeah. Well, I should be in some questions, but um, I mean, that's what the entire clean meat uh, or cultivated meat would be, uh, would be doing. It's all, it's all processing. You got it. This is a great audience. You should. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, do you want to work for USDA? <laughs> this is Professor Stills. She's our faculty director of our program and teaches both uh, the Department of Farm Animal Law course last year and is uh, that's when she's teaching uh, her her and her teacher. Right. Property law says. <laughs> yeah, the processing, right? That's Are they going to stare at the bats? Is that what's, what are they going to look at? Hold on to that thought. Um, <laughs> So, so USDA labeling oversight, similar to FDA's, except they have prior approval for labels of meat and poultry products. Um, the labels have to bear product naming and other mandatory information, but also similar to what you see when you're looking on a plant-based product with the exception of um, a handling statement, how you cook the product. Um, product naming has applicable standards of identity, also similar to FDA's and that same hierarchical system. And so on the right-hand side of the slide is a, is a definite a standard by identity for hamburger in, in part. It says hamburger shall consist of chopped, fresh, or frozen beef with or without the addition of beef fat, such as and or seasoning and other kinds of ingredients. And so uh, hold on to, to that thought relating to, to both processing and the definition of beef. Um, FTC, just very briefly, and FTC hasn't been very hasn't been discussed in this space uh, just yet. But but under MOUs that go back to the seventies, um, the way that FDA and FTC and FSI or USDA uh, share jurisdiction over advertising is that FDA generally has oversight over labeling. FTC has oversight over advertising. And the same holds true with respect to USDA, though historically, most of the action has been between FDA and FTC when it comes to, to um, FTC enforcement. Um, all right, so now that you know all that you need to know in, in that time period about how it's regulated, let's talk a little bit about cultivated wheat. Um, this is a technology that, for no, uh, for obvious reasons, has captured um, immense attention uh, in in the, in the world of food tech and in the world of sustainability um, and animal welfare. I think when we all first met, there was maybe how many companies that that were in the space? We first met. Yeah, well, not you and I. When yeah. we were working on this together. I think there were two. No, three, three, <laughs> three. And even in 2016, at that first cellular conference, there were maybe 10, less than 20 for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's grown exponentially. Um, this 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 map is now out of date. It means in 2020. Um, how many companies would be say are in this now? Like 115 total. Yeah, it's incredible um, to see that kind of growth that quickly and across the world. Um, I oh thank you. Um, okay, all right. I'm gonna turn it over to Eric. So what is cultivated meat? Yeah, bear with me. I'm sorry, my allergies have been up, so I'm trying not to talk too much. Okay, the bottom line is it's meat, which did a great job of explaining legally. Scientifically, same thing. Again, we can go home now. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I led the first, so Upside Foods is the very first ever cultivated meat company, and I was one of the first hires, actually uh, came in and um, set up our regulatory shop and also my day job was 
designing the meat. So design all the products and the, had to build a whole design space for cultivated meat. And it, it is designed food. It is not animal down. It is gene up. It's more like 3D printing than it is growing animal free. And I think that's really important to how we produce it. Um, like again, the, the production process generally breaks down to basically two, three big processes. One is sort of identifying the cell source and materials and obtaining high quality genetics of animal cells from animals. And then characterizing those cells so that they are producing consistent safe products. Um, once you have that product, once you have those cells, then you can move them into production. Um, and in this case, you know, you'd be growing, taking one cell and turning it into trillions of cells very quickly. That process is arguably from the outside, the sort of um, the fastest part of the process when you hear about how long it takes to grow cells to um, grow these products. You're doing a cow's worth of meat, um, you know, every two weeks or less, you know, and a cow right now to go from birth to birth to store shelf is 18 months to three years. So just think about that in terms of parallel process. Um, and then the third step is the meat processing, which was is very is nearly identical to the actual meat processing you see for conventional products. The longest part of this process, in reality, is once you obtain the cells and characterize. That's the multi-year process right now. Once you have that library of cells, we do. We have a library of these cells from different muscles of different parts of the animals. Um, it can last for up to twenty years. So you don't have to go back to an animal for potentially 20 years per muscle group, per, per biopsy. So from one animal, you can get 10 or 20 biopsies from dark meat, white meat, from tenderloin, from chuck meat, it's a cow, you know, those sorts of things. So just imagine you can mix and match the different muscle groups, the different muscle types, and then we're going to talk about genetic engineering um, and designing up to the product you want. Um, which we can also do. So that's controlling the nutritional output of those products as well as the functional attributes. Um, there's a lot more there. <laughs> that's the that's the one I want. But um, the, the main point is getting to a master cell bank, which you see here on the slide, which is that library. From there, you that's effectively the regulatory checkpoint when FDA steps in and says, all right, now we're going to see this is your production process. And then you produce the cells in these giant near brewery like uh, cultivator tanks. If you walk to our facility right now, I should come visit, field trip. Um, <laughs> the, um, it looks like a cross between a small beer brewery, like a craft brewery, and a small dairy operation. Like, it would look no different. It's just stainless steel tubes and pipes and everywhere. Um, and so uh, and the process is aseptic. Meaning, um, generally speaking, it's hard for bacteria to get into the system when we're growing our cells. So, uh, interesting questions around food spoilage, food stability um, for our products, as well as what can be the risk of contamination of these products. In general, you're not fighting salmonella because that's inherent to chickens. We don't have that. We're more worried about humans contaminating the products since we are the thing that they're mostly going to interact. So there's different spoilage drugs now as well to food. Lots of interesting exciting questions. But this is the general process of how you produce it. With no fecal matter, so E. coli just is all right. Correct. Um, you kind of touched on this earlier, but I wondered if you could go a little bit more into how you select and source tissue and how much meat do you need? And do you think the industry could ever get to the point where you're biopsying an animal without having to kill them? Good questions. Yeah, really big questions. Um, the amount of cells we need is the equivalent of the amount of water that would stick to the tip of the needle if it was dipped in a limited size swimming pool. So that's how much I need in order to produce the next 20 years. Um, that translates to what sounds like a large number, we need about 10 million cells. But that's how many, I mean, there's 40 trillion cells in your body, 70 trillion cells there. That's a lot, of, that's, that's not a lot of cells. Um, the idea right now is to focus on, there's two ways to do this. What, what meat is versus what meat can be. We're focusing on that first one. That's like consumers. We want people to like be very familiar with these products. So right now it's about preventing animals from existing that otherwise would be suffering, if that makes sense. 
So for, for us, it's not having to produce an animal that we can produce an equivalent amount of tissue from. Um, in the future, I don't see it actually being very long before we never have to back the animal, period, especially with the, if we're embracing genetic engineering. Uh, genetic engineering opens up every door possible in terms of the allowance for the cells that never, um, under appropriate conditions, will continue to grow forever safely. And I think it's, it's, it's also my understanding that not every animal from which a biopsy is taken necessarily has to go. Is that correct? That's correct. You can take them from uh, embryonic, juvenile, or adult animals. Um, there are some caveats with each one, but and we do all three, just depending on what we're looking for. But there are stem cells in, in all of them. Is there a methodology to how you're picking which animals to biopsy from from specific farms, and are they selected for specific traits? Yep. No, we do. We have a not only do we have a committee on uh, at Upside that for ethics reasons as well trying to determine which animals do best to do this, but also certain breeds have different genetic backgrounds and more preferable. Believe it or not, certain chickens' cells will grow better in culture than other chickens, and they may not be the chickens we're eating today. That's another reason. And two, just like anything else, uh, the stronger, the higher the platform you work from genetically, the easier it is to grow them to the desired outcome. The less work we have to do uh, in culture as well. Uh, yeah, you touched a little bit on the ones that need to be probably similar to um, regular meat, but then on the other hand, there might be a possibility to make the human meat even like healthier, having less saturated fats, for example. What is the trade out there? Sure. I mean, for us, I think there's, there's, there's no wrong way per se to do it, but I will say, again, when we were at the agency together, we saw novel food products come through all the time. And one of the things that I, I personally witnessed that I wanted to try to serve that on the other side was this idea that um, People thought novelty was enough to be a repeat purchase. But I think that inherently goes against the definition of novelty. Um, I want to be a mundane, boring, everyday purchase. And in order to do that, I have to look, feel, and behave exactly like chicken you see today. I don't want it to be a debate. I just want it to be, I want you to be opting into um, the climate aspects, the ethical aspects, pick and choose whatever you like without really having to try. It's a, I want to be because it's a delicious product and the prices are. However, we do have a blue sky, sun works division, whatever you call it, that does work on this what meat can be. Um, because our, 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 our CEO is a cardiologist, um, he worked at Mayo Clinic and he very much wants that meat that is heart healthy. Here's how FDA has described animal cell culture. Cell culture food technology, which we call cultivated. I want you to think about it based upon the statutory provisions that we just talked about um, in the history. Controlled growth of animal cells from livestock, poultry, fish, or other animals, their subsequent differentiation into various cell types, and their collection and processing into food. And then if you look at this screen on the far left, it's tissue collection, different steps until establishing a master cell bank, which Eric talked to us about. Then we move to the far right and the use of substances in media culture to grow, proliferate the cells, differentiate the cells, and that post-harvest process and after that is processing. So how did we get here? How, how, how have we gotten to a place where Upside Foods is the first company to have gotten a pre-market consultation completed with FDA and just this week, Good Meat became the second company. Well, it happened relatively quickly. So after, what was the round table? Nope, 2018, okay. summer 2018. So shortly before the round table, um, uh, uh, a trade group called the U.S. Cattlemen's Association petitioned the USDA asking FSIS to establish labeling requirements that exclude um, products that are not from cattle that have been born, raised, and harvested in a traditional manner. The thrust of that petition was that this, this technology cannot be called meat. It cannot be called beef because it is not from a carcass. It is not from cattle that has, uh, that has been born, raised, and harvested. 
Um, that received, if not the highest, among the highest number of comments from for an FSIS petition in history. Um, so excited about it. I'm dashing this microphone. Um, it was spicy. It was a lot of comments. <laughs> um, a, a couple months later, um, the Secretary of Agriculture told um, and how a, 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 a committee, a powerful committee, um, in response to questions about the technology that meat and poultry products that are labeled with those terms are under the sole purview of USDA because USDA regulates meat and poultry products. But a month after that, the, that committee reported a bill um, that, that didn't pass, but it directed USDA to exclusively regulate um, regulate. Uh, Cell culture or cell based meat or cultivated meat. Okay, then around that time we had Harvard Roundtable here in June. Um, FDA issued a statement saying that cell cultured meat is subject to FDA's oversight because remember, food is food. <laughs> and FDA restated the food definition and said that they have oversight over this technology. USDA responded saying that FDA's claim of jurisdiction over food and anything that is food is so overly broad that it implies that USDA doesn't have a role. Remember, USDA regulates meat and poultry. That July meeting happened uh, a month later. Eric spoke at that meeting. He was asked to speak by the agency. Um, FDA indicated jurisdiction over products. Those products that said, well, they resemble meat and poultry. And FDA emphasized their unique and relevant expertise based on oversight over food developed using biosystem processes, using um, culture systems, using biotechnology. And they also emphasize that their use, uh, their, their expertise with respect to biologics that are developed um, in, in similar settings. They focused on safety, but they left some discussion open on labeling. And what did these probably not, not notify myself also is how much work we play behind the scenes, because as you can see, this is a political um, intimidation with each other match. And so a lot of brokering needed to happen and information transfer um, that, that Diffie and I managed on behalf of US government. They're very well. <laughs> I always think of like that far side comment with kind of that like eraser fight with like all the, you know, scientists or whatever fight throwing things at each other. But yeah, it yeah. got a little. Bloody is probably not the right term, but yeah. Yeah. So, you know, there was a, a bit of a turf war emerging, right? You had FDA saying, well, we have oversight over this. You have USDA saying, well, we have oversight over this technology. Um, and in August of that year, Memphis Meats, which is the uh, now Offside Foods, submitted a letter to the administration um, arguing that existing law and practice, as well as precedent, demonstrate that both agencies have a role to play called for FDA to have oversight over pre-market safety under its food additive authorities. If anything added to the process, it becomes incorporated into the food that doesn't otherwise fall within an exemption. FDA should have oversight under that part of the statute. Called for FDA to have oversight over um, pre-market safety under that, that those provisions. Post-harvest called for USDA to regulate processing and labeling and said that this isn't new. This has been the, the framework since nearly the beginning of the, the 20th century. Um, a lot of work went into, into making that argument as Eric described. About a month later, FDA and USDA announced that they'll have a joint public meeting. They hold that joint public meeting in October, a month after that. Eric spoke at that meeting. They had an advisory committee meeting the day before that as well to go over safety. Eric spoke at that as well. Um, but a month after that, they issued a joint statement concluding that they would oversee cell cultured meat and poultry in a joint regulatory uh, oversight manner, which culminated in this photo of Ben's uh, Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue, and the commissioner of uh, FDA, Dr. Scott Gott, who was staring at a tomato at the same time at the FDA farmer's market. Um, it's a great symbol of, of a joint um, oversight. <laughs> and we had some of our uh, clinic students actually uh, spoke at that meeting as well. Yes. Um, in March 2019, the following year, the agencies issue a joint agreement, um, a formal agreement outlining how they will oversee these products. FDA will regulate tissue collection, cell lines, and cell banks, everything you saw on that screen, everything that Eric talked about, 
all components and inputs um, and cell proliferation and differentiation through the time of harvest, overfight then transfer to FSIS, finished product must bear market inspection and, and products are subject to pre-market review with respect to labeling. Seafood except for catfish stays with FDA um, under this system. Going a little bit quickly, with respect to labeling, the agencies issued um, uh, request for information, advanced notice, post rulemaking, describing how they would label those products, their products. Um, in response to, actually, even before they issued these um, uh, materials, the clinic submitted a letter to um, USDA explaining why. Uh, uh, the publication of a rule of general applicability across all products would raise serious First Amendment concerns. It was an excellently written letter um, about which was turned into a petition explaining that the agency should evaluate the facts of individual products um, before making speech restrictions um, across the board. You know, one of our friends, Kevin Lugo, who's working in a clinic. You know, one of the if you kind of divvied up how we thought this the regulatory framework should be should be set. Um, it was desired that that USDA and FSAS would have control of labeling because they have stronger preemption. Um, and that then once that was sort of determined, uh, we just kind of remind, wanted to remind them of their constitutional obligations in, in order to kind of fire a shot across their ballots so they didn't try to do something that was overly restrictive. Uh, and so our, our clinic student Kelly McGill drafted that. And then when we sent it to them, they wrote back and said, Oh, we're receipt of your formal petition for rulemaking. Like, okay, great. And then when they, um, uh, the next year when they put out this uh, advanced notice proposed rulemaking, there was a whole section of in the federal register that Harvard Animal Law Policy Clinic and said, you know, we're you know, we we don't we just really have to do this because we got this other this pesky clinic over here that's like forcing our hand to do this. But it, it was a really good indicator that they. This is an issue that they probably really wanted to address anyway, and we kind of used our, our letter uh, as, a, as a bit of a foil and, and it was just justified doing so. Does that seem accurate? Absolutely. So if you look at that advanced notice of proposal making, you'll see a discussion of the petition, and the petition is in the document as well. Um, so that brings us closer to where we are today. In November of last year, FDA completed a pre-market consultation. Remember, under its pre-existing authorities, evaluating whether food that would go into meat and poultry is safe under this process. Um, it was issued to outside foods. FDA uh, published an over 20-page scientific memorandum explaining what they reviewed. You can see that here. At a high level, they reviewed all the steps in the production process that we described on an earlier slide. Um, and uh, that um, process where it was years in the making, um, uh, including developing, you know, advocating for this regulatory framework in the first place. Yeah. And it was, uh, and I hope it's becoming apparent, every step is deliberate and a breadcrumb leading to where we're going next. It's all done in concert and in partnership with the US government and stakeholders. Like none of this was done haphazardly or without intent. Um, and that, I think that's why this was so fast. Um, and also the documents are so thoughtful from both the agency and from us. Like we wrote it, we wrote a non-redacted public version. It's over hundred pages long. That's intentional. We wanted it to be copied. We wanted it to be a playbook. Um, we hope you do all that um, to help us work and be better. And it's also, you know, I mean, it's interesting. It was interesting to us, like we said, that we were Jenkins issue is that when all these companies started, they were very mission driven of wanting to kind of change the world and reduce the number of, of animals that are killed each year. Um, but they are actually doing so by entering into, into a competitive marketplace. And there was concern that once those competitive influences took hold, that it, it might have some, some weird incentives. Um, but I really, really have to commend outside for the sort of like the drafting and the Tour de France. They're the, they're the, they're the, the lead bicycle and they are catching all of the wind, um, but doing so for the good of the entire industry. And, uh, you know, really kudos to them for, for putting in so much work and spending so many so much time and resources in kind of forging this regulatory pathway that a lot of other companies are going to benefit from without having had to, uh, you know, spend those, re expend those resources. So it is really a great public good that you all are doing. Thank you. And if you want to be first, you got to spend money. That's not, I don't know, people don't say that more often. <laughs> so, what are some of the facts? Yes, gotta spend money, gotta spend money.
the pioneers often, often bear the, the pioneer barrels. Um, and so FDA issued a no questions letter to the company in, in November. You might be asking yourself, why is it called a no questions letter? Why isn't this an approval? Remember what I said at the outset, FDA doesn't pre-approve foods. It pre-approves food additives unless those food additives are not food additives, unless they're ingredients that fall within exemptions or otherwise are considered safe. And to mark the culmination of that review, FDA tells the manufacturer that it has no questions about the safety of its production process and the regulatory status of its ingredients, which is exactly what FDA told Upside um, when, when Upside received its, its uh, completion of the consultation process. And that brings us to today, um, just this week, the second company in this space completed a pre-market consultation as well, unlike Upside's product, which is um, uh, a tissue product, it, the cells grow, uh, beyond um, beyond just being in their cellular state into tissue formation. This product is a suspension cell product, which Eric's going to be able to tell you more about, but I'm going to rush us through through it um, so we can get to the end here. Um, and in terms of what the agency reviewed, it's very similar to what the agency reviewed um, for outside. Um, and it's all available in an inventory. So what does that mean? Um, what, do, what, what is actually regulated? So if you take all of that and apply it down to, to its fairest form, FDA on the pre-market safety guide evaluates substances used in manufacturing. It's doing that under its food additive authorities, including substances that go into meat and poultry. It assesses whether the manufacturing affects the identity, composition, or safety. It's doing that through a pre-market consultation process. It's applying its pre-existing histories to or pre-existing authorities to establish. Uh, confirm safety. Um, as Chris mentioned, USDA is evaluating labeling. Um, USDA has pre-market oversight to do so, um, and it, uh, it its review carries um, greater preemptive effect than FDA's. I'm actually going to skip to what to expect next since we're a little bit over. And here's what, what comes next. So FDA and USDA have established working groups to clarify processes. There's still work to be done. Um, what's going to come out of those working groups? The FDA is going to issue a draft guidance on pre-market consultations, what they're going to evaluate with respect to safety. USDA and FDA are going to develop joint principles on labeling. Um, USDA has said specifically that they will promulgate a rule um, that I think will be the subject of a lot of attention. Um, they, they've said that they'll promulgate it this year, proposed rule, I shouldn't say promulgate, issue, issue a proposed rule. And so we can expect a lot of comments to that proposed rule, a lot of attention. USDA also is going to be issuing guidance for its inspectors to uh, uh, how to conduct these inspections. And I think we'll see more product specific determinations and we'll hopefully see some label approvals on the USDA side and um, some, some continued completions of the consultation process. For the broader ecosystem, I think on the federal side, we're going to see continued political interest, maybe legislation, depending on how labeling shakes out. If history repeats itself, we might get continued calls that meat does not come, this meat is not meat because it doesn't come from the carcass of an animal. Um, there's a lot of companies that uh, are producing this product outside the US, as you saw on that big map, on that global map. Um, and so I think we're going to see some questions with respect to import and export into different countries. There isn't a tariff schedule that, that <laughs> the, the harm of the HTS schedule doesn't address this, the way that we import products into different countries um, is going to have to be evaluated. Um, with a lot of attention on sustainability claims, ESG, I think FTC is, um, might, might start to become involved. And I wouldn't be surprised if we see some litigation in this space. On the state side, um, there's nine, at least nine states that have passed laws that um, uh, restrict the use of conventional meat terms for plant-based products, as well as some that have already applied to this, this technology, even though there are no products on the market. Um, and so I think we're going to see some interesting questions about preemption. As Chris mentioned, the USDA statute has expressed preemption provisions that have been interpreted by courts to sweep far more broadly than FDA's. 
Um, and so that will be that will be an interesting um, development to, to watch. And I think we can see some continued litigation. And then in terms of the investment um, landscape, I think we'll continue to see investment in this space, uh, inside and outside the US, despite um, the collapse of Silicon Valley. Um, no comment. <laughs> And one thing too, I just that you clarified last night. Um, even while we're waiting for uh, USDA and FSS to come back with their um, note of proposed rulemaking on what they decide to do with labeling, that doesn't mean that that brings everything to a grinding halt. That companies still may go uh, to USDA and FSS for a uh, case by case labeling approval. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. And if you think about it, like imagine if the government said, oh no, you can't come to market because we're gonna take 10 years to promulgate this regulation. Which they're most concerned about. Yeah, yeah, no, a lot of people were. Um, and I I the 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 petition from the clinics explained that doing that would be a violation of among other things, the first amendment, it would be um uh the argument was that it would uh chill speech in advance of any product coming into the market. Um, and USC has responded uh, by saying that they'll review individual product labels on a case-by-case -case basis under their pre-existing statutory authorities. So I think what that means is that those individual labels would play a role in, in shaping policy for the Great, excellent. Well, thank you all so much. And uh, yeah, we've got time for some questions. Yeah, uh, just a quick question. It's not really on the regular. Where it's at, but I'm just wondering if with current climate concerns around organic food waste, if there's any difference in the expected shelf life of these products, or if that's something that you're considering in the public. Yeah, shelf life is much longer than um, so uh conventional chicken um in the fridge is supposed to be two days for USDA. Uh, two weeks roughly for most chicken. Um, um our products that we we stopped the experiment um, after nine months. So significant, we're not going to be advertising it. Very important to say that like, that's not how we handle it. It'll be subject to the same rules that chicken has today. But yes, we expect, depending on how it's processed or managed, that the shelf life is considerably longer, potentially even getting to room temperature or non refrigerated storage conditions, which would be amazing for. Um, if we needed to ship these products um, to places with unreliable electricity. <clears throat> I don't know who went first. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll call that. Right yeah, yeah, great. Kyle's? Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, so, of, of course, I have several questions, but um, I'm concerned, or I want to know uh, what you think about, like, uh, if you're ready to go to market, uh, uh, what would be the, the price of this of this product, more or less, in terms of the access? Or if most of the mainstream, like the public, will have access, like uh, to to pay for this product, if if you your idea is to make this product mainstream, or if it's going to be like maybe like like a luxury for I don't know rich people. <laughs> yeah, the the goal is retail products wherever you buy meat today. And and like the most commonly consumed meat products, like again, I'm not exactly like chicken nuggets, and tenders and stuff, um, chopped and formed products that you would feed uh, your family. That's our initial strategy um, is to scale up to a point where we're just being sold everywhere grocery stores where you buy meat, frozen on fresh aisle, what have you. Um, we are launching in restaurants mainly because we're going to be supply constraints. Um, and we want to be able to produce consistently. And get feedback on that limited product run very quickly, efficiently. Chefs are just a great place to start with that. But um, chicken nuggets are, I would say, like cheap, very cheap product. It, in terms of how much it costs you to produce this, it will be profitable. Really? Yeah. So, so for right now, uh, at our current scaling, we're producing you know, like tens of dollars per pound. It's definitely not the most expensive meat. It's probably the most expensive chicken, not the most expensive meat on the planet. Um, we have line of sight into at our commercial sale, which we're building right now, facility around price parity with with shipping products, meat products. So, what you pay per pound for conventional product, and we. In my mind, I've always thought about sort of like electric cars, like the the 
first of the, the late generation of electric cars came out, like Tesla made it really expensive because it was really you know expensive technology. Um, but that also generated a, a kind of a, a, an interest or a cachet that made it sort of desirable. Um, and then as the technology improved, they were able to come out with you know, the Model X and the Model Y, which are um, much less expensive and much more accessible by a, a broad range of consumers. I think now you see pretty much every car maker in the country or in the world they are developing electronic uh, electric vehicles, and you're going to see the price come down further and further until there is some security. But you kind of have to start somewhere. Or even the Prius. Remember when the Prius first came out and the R didn't have a on? Mm -hmm. now, my dad drives. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, your dad is in there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Cindy, you have a question? Yeah. Um, so this is more related to the regarding the processing uh, of the cultivated meat. So as this novel industry expands and sort of begins to rival the traditional meat family and other industries as you scale up, do you foresee any problem with the maintenance of an aseptic environment um, or, or any issues with, uh, I don't know, just just like sanitation or, or safety as it becomes a bigger industry and you're worried about um, potentially like lack, you know, care or attention to each. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yes, we've already, it's part of our it was part of that free market evaluation was being able to control for those hazards um, and then showing how we would mitigate or maintain what's called a sterile envelope around the um, production process. Luckily, we've got 40 years of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry that worked out a lot of these issues for us ahead of time. So a lot of our staff are from the vaccine production industry, for example. They know how to keep a, uh, a production systems like sealed up properly, no likely places of intercrass, and how to optimize the system to make sure it stays sterile for years at a time. Um, that was all accounted for, and you should read it. It's in our and uh, how we do that in our pre market evaluation. And again, just relatively comparing that to the way that traditional slaughtered meat is, is produced, where they have literally a separate size called like clean and dirty, where you have a hide that has all these pathogens on that could, you know. Contaminate the meat, and you have separate workers that aren't even allowed to interact, and it's it's there's so much potential for for waste there. So I wish we could stay and talk more, really, but we have flights. Oh, they do. Yeah. Um, well, please again, thank you so much uh, for everyone for for attending. Please join me in thanking Vicky and Eric for attending.